Heavenly Father, thank you very much for this time to get together, to be with your people gathered together from all over the world. We're appreciative of what you're building here in the body of Christ. And we know you're causing all these trials for good, but we do ask you to be with all those that are suffering and struggling and dealing with all these different things you send our, our way. We know it's necessary and it's going to be good in the end, but we need faith and endurance to wait for you to complete this work. We ask you to be with us during this study and give us great wisdom and the ability to understand all the things you're going to teach us tonight and the power to keep them. In Christ's name, amen. Um, welcome, Freddie. I just saw your name there on the list. So we're back on our Wednesday night study here, and we're going to be talking about waiting on the Lord. And the title is Those Who Wait for the Lord Will Not Be Ashamed. And as we say often, whenever the scriptures tell you something, it's because you're naturally going to think the opposite. That there's a, there's a big temptation to feel ashamed and lose patience and think, why am I keeping the commands? And where's the fruit going to come? And all I'm getting is a lot of suffering from all this. And how long is it going to take? And we get tired and we weary and we turn to idols, and that's how we really become ashamed. So hopefully this study will encourage everyone to wait patiently for the Lord and keep his commands, and in due time, it'll all work out just as he, <clears throat> as he says. <clears throat> so we're going to start here in Psalms 25, verse 1 to 3. A Psalm of David. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, I trust in you. Let me not be ashamed. Let not my enemies triumph over me. Indeed, no one who waits on you, indeed, let no one who waits on you be ashamed. Let those be ashamed who deal treacherously without cause. So as always, the first application is within, and we don't want our enemies and our carnal mind and the, the big beast that our flesh is to triumph over us. That's what we want to overcome. But we also don't want our enemies without to, to overcome us. And we pray, Lord, let us who wait on you not be ashamed. And he will answer that. Romans 10, 11, for the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. And that takes a lot of faith to believe that, because as we're going to see, a lot of shameful things happen to Christ. I mean, abandoned by his disciples, people denying him, you know, scourged, you know, stripped, a crown of thorns put on his head, crucified. I mean, you would look at that and go, that's a pretty shameful thing to happen to you publicly, right? But we know that that was only temporary suffering, that in the end, it resulted in him being at the right hand of God and ruling and reigning in all things with him. And that's our destiny as well. We just have to endure the process it takes to get there, which is really difficult. Isaiah 49, 21 to 23. Then you will say in your heart, who has begotten these for me, since I have lost my children and am desolate, a captive and wandering to and fro, and who has brought these up? There I was left alone, but these, where were they? And this is what we say in our heart. Like, what's going on? What do I have to show for following the Lord? Lord, we've left all and followed you. And what's our reward? And the Lord says, Behold, I will lift my hand in an oath to the nations. So think about this. He knows in our heart we're going to be complaining about this difficulty and this struggle and all the lack and we're going to experience throughout our life. And he says, Behold, I'm going to swear an oath. Like, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. So is the Lord good to keep his promises? Does he say things that are happening that don't come to happen? No, of course not. So let's read this in that context with God telling us what he's going to do. And set up my standard for the peoples. They shall bring your sons in their arms and your daughters shall be carried on their shoulders. Kings shall be your foster fathers and their queens your nursing mothers. They shall bow down to you with their faces to the earth and lick up the dust of your feet. 
So let's start in the physical and imagine you're being oppressed by this big, powerful people. And the Lord says, don't worry about it. Their kings are going to adopt you and their, and their queens are going to be your mothers and they're going to lick the dust off your feet. Wow, that's quite a prophecy. These big, powerful nations are going to serve you? And what are the nations? They're the principalities and powers in our heavens, the things that rule our hearts and our minds we can't have dominion over. And he's saying, all those things within you are going to serve you. You will rule over all these things that have troubled you so much, just as the elect will rule and reign outwardly in due time, just as Joseph's brothers came back to him. But remember, in order to receive that outward blessing, we have to first overcome within and have all of these enemies within us lick the dust at the bottom of our feet. Lick the dust of our feet. Then you will know that I am the Lord, for they shall not be ashamed to wait for me. So what's so amazing about that? I mean, these big powerful nations do not submit to these weak people. It just doesn't happen. It's a miracle, and then you know that the Lord did it. And the same thing happens when you really are confronted with your own beast, and you go, this is an unruly beast. Who can tame this? And it really is completely overwhelming when the Lord gives you a glimpse of it, what it's like. But those who wait for the Lord will not be ashamed. He's going to overcome that. And we're going to talk about what waiting on him means. It, it's actually a very active process. It doesn't mean, always mean sitting still and doing nothing. It means keeping his commands, not running to idols, and then letting him work things out in his time. Hebrews 12, 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So him enduring the cross and despising the shame, all the terrible things that happened to him, that was him waiting on the Lord, right? He didn't take things into his own hands. He didn't try to fight back like Peter did and pick up the sword. And he waited for the Lord to do. And what did it cost? It cost him his life. So what it's saying is, we have to lose our lives. We have to be living, willing to give up our pride, give up our timelines, give up our expectations, because our reward is not fulfilled in this life. We get a down payment of the hundredfold. We get brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers, and we get peace and joy within and overcoming, but with persecutions, because this is not our home. A better thing is to come, and we have to have our eyes on this and view this world as just the time where we are letting our light shine and setting the example, demonstrating what our true value is on the things of the Spirit, the all in all to come. And that is how we endure and wait for the Lord. Matthew, which really waiting on the Lord requires a lot of battle too. You're doing a lot of warfare in the heavens to wait. Sometimes the hardest thing to do is to stand still because you're fighting in your mind like crazy to not take it into your own hands and use your idols to try to deliver ourselves. Matthew 27, 27 to 31. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole garrison around him, and they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. When they had twisted a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed on his right hand, and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they spat on him and took the reed and struck him on his head. And when they had mocked him, they took the robe off him, put his own clothes on him, and led him away to be crucified. That's what waiting on the Lord looks like. Right? It's difficult. You're going to be mocked. You're going to be scourged. You're going to have evil things said about you. You're going to be despised. But look how meek Christ was. He just took it. The scriptures say it's... A, it's Great understanding gives a man patience and its glory to overlook an offense. Look how many offenses Christ overlooked. Even to the point where he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Because he knew how ignorant and deceived they all were. Because the Lord had made it that way. It would have been so wrong of him to unleash all this power and call down fire from heaven and destroy them all. It wasn't time for that. And the same thing will happen to us. We'll have knowledge, understanding. We know what's going on. And the Lord's like, just be quiet and take it. Just 
You know, there's a time to rebuke the Pharisees. There's a time for a sharp word, but there's also a time to just be led like a lamb to the slaughter. First Corinthians four <clears throat> nine to fourteen. For I think that God has displayed us, the apostles, last as men condemned to death. For we have been made a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to men, just like Christ was. He was made a spectacle. It's a pretty big spectacle. See, he'd see this person who was out feeding the 5,000 and preaching the truth hanging on a cross for all to see, <clears throat> right? It's quite a spectacle. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are distinguished, but we are dishonored. So remember, this is Paul writing to the carnal Corinthians, who, they're babes in Christ. They're squabbling, having all these infightings within the church. And, you know, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Christ. You know, Christ is not divided. Who are you trying to follow, men? And they were just so conflicted and in themselves. And they really thought they were something in the flesh. And Paul's saying, look, you think you're all strong and distinguished, and, you know, it's, it's nothing. You don't really know what's truly valuable. To this present hour, we both hunger and thirst, and we're poorly clothed and beaten and homeless. And we labor, working with our own hands, being reviled, we bless, being persecuted, we endure. These are the same apostles that the Lord says those that preach the gospel should live of the gospel. I mean, they had a biblical right to say, guys, you should be paying us for all this teaching we're doing you. You should be honoring us for the messengers of God we are. What did they do? They labored for their own food. They provided for themselves. They worked with their own hands. They suffered all the persecution. They just bared with the Corinthians because they weren't ready yet. They had to go through this season of persecuting their, their very teacher who brought them the gospel before they could grow up and mature out of it. And so we're all the same way. We're going to be apostles to this world. And you have to, like parents, bear the burden of the kids. You can't expect kids to provide for the parents. It's not until the children are mature and the parents are old that the role starts to change and the kids can help take care of the parents. But that, that happens much later. And, and even then, the reason the kids are doing well is because the parents laid up a good store and an inheritance for them. Being defamed, we entreat. <clears throat> we have been made as the filth of the world, the offscouring of all things, until now. So this is only for a season. The time comes when we are elevated in people's eyes, and the Lord does bring us the honor. And just like in Egypt, when all the people came to Joseph for the grain, because he was storing up the grain before the famine, and his brothers come to him, we threw him in the pit come to get fed. So we're the same way. If we suffer with Christ, keep our peace, keep doing our work, minding our business, storing up these treasures in heaven, saying, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. The day is going to come when their eyes are opened and they're like, oh my goodness, you have what I need. And people start to realize. I do not write these things to shame you, but as my beloved children, I warn you. Now, if the Corinthians have the proper response, they're going to feel ashamed, right? They're going to feel guilty. They're going to feel terrible about themselves. And that zeal for repentance to become godly will grow in them. But Paul's motive was, I'm just not here to try to shame you, and rub it in your face. I'm trying to warn you as my children saying, look, guys, if you keep doing this, it's not going to go well for you. This is not the right path to stay on. And in our own time, we have to say these things to folks, right? 2 Timothy 2, 10 to 13, Therefore I endure all things for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Part of enduring all things for the elect is what he dealt with in Corinth. This is a faithful saying, for if we died with him, we shall also live with him. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. So if we want to reign with Christ, we have to endure with him. 
which means we should expect all of this persecution and evil speaking. It's just part of the process. Now, the scriptures also say if they persecute you in this city, flee to the next. So there's no, no need to have to stay where you are and keep suffering. If the Lord makes a way for escape, by all means, pack your bags and move on. But don't be surprised when persecution happens. Galatians 6, 9, And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Again, why does he have to tell us that? Because we're going to lose heart and we're going to faint and we're going to get tired and we're going to say, Lord, I don't want to do this anymore. And he says, I understand you're tired. Wait on me and I'll restore your spirit and I'll lift you up and you know, you'll, you'll be okay. Psalms 27, 11 to 14. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me in a smooth path because of my enemies. Do not deliver me to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and such as breathe out violence. So remember, first and foremost, this is our own carnal mind and all these high thoughts that exalt themselves against God that just attack us to no end. That's the adversary we need to be delivered from. Because this knowledge we're being given Knowledge puffs up, and we're being given a lot, and it will puff us up beyond belief. And that's why the Lord sends the thorns and the persecutions to put us back in our place and say, I'm giving you a lot, now be humble with it. I'll take what you have and give it to another. I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. So if we don't believe that God is going to be all in all, he's going to wipe, wipe away every tear, and this is going to work out in the end, we would just give up. But we also have to believe that it's good to fear God, and if we don't keep his commands, it's not going to go well. So you, you have both sides, the, the carrot and the stick, so to speak, to, to motivate us. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage. And he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. It takes a lot of courage to wait when the armies of Egypt are closing in on you and you're trapped in front of the Red Sea. And you're thinking, great, here they come to kill me. Right? Just like when Moses led Israel out of Egypt. It takes courage to stand there and wait. But when you wait on the Lord and do what he says, he does strengthen our heart and he will restore us and get us through it. But there are some harrowing times and it would seem easier to just give in, just serve the idol, just do what the what your carnal mind and the people around you want you to do. Give in. But that's that's false deliverance. It's te it temporarily solves the problem, but then it comes back with a vengeance. And it's a hundred times worse. So it's better to stand and wait on the Lord and be on his side than to serve the idols and be his enemy. That really doesn't feel well. Isaiah 40, 28 to 31. Have you not known, have you not heard the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary? His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak, and to those who have no might, he increases strength. If we believe that, then we'll wait for him because we know he's the only one that can give us what we need. Understanding and strength. Even the youths shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not be faint. But the key is we have to wait. We have to stop sometimes and just say, look, let these things work out. Just let the Lord do it. I can't overwork to be rich. But we also can't be lazy and cowardly and not boldly do the things he wants us to do. Because this is war, but it's also waiting. And there's a time for everything. There's a time to push through and there's a time to just sit there and wait. And we have to know what time it is to do each one. It's a very, very narrow way. Isaiah 30, verse 18. Therefore the Lord will wait that he may be gracious to you. And therefore he will be exalted that he may have mercy on you. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all those who wait for him. Um, I read a quote a while back, and I forgot who said it, but 
it said, most of the world's problems come from man's inability to sit quietly in a room by himself. And I thought that was so profound. Like It takes a lot to just sit quietly by yourself in peace and wait. But it's very powerful when you do it at the appropriate time. It takes a lot of self-control to keep our own feet in our house and mind our business and not do all this other nonsense, right? 2 Peter 3, 1 to 13. Beloved, I now write to you this second epistle, in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder. So this is what we're doing to one another with all these studies is bringing to remembrance the promises we've been told because we just get tired. And you got to remember to be patient and wait. That you may be mindful of the words which were spoken for by the holy prophets and of the commandments of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts. Within, always. We walk according to our own lusts, first and foremost. And saying, where's the promise of his coming? For since the Father fell asleep, all things continue on as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willfully forget, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of water and in the water, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. The heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. What he's saying is, don't say, where's the promise of his coming, as if the Lord's not going to keep his word. Well, you think he's late, or he's not going to do it? Did he get tired and give up? It's like, no, he's flooded the earth before. The only reason he's not destroying with fire now is he's being patient to have us get together <coughs> and be ready. So we have to remember that, that it's to the Lord, the, the time passing is a day is a thousand years, a thousand years is a day. It, it feels like forever when you're in suffering, but you, when you look back, it's really fast. And when you look on others going through suffering, you can see how it's necessary, but it's hard when you're going through it yourself. Get it? I mean, imagine watching a little kid learn how to read and write and go through school, and you as the parent are like, no, it's okay, it's going to take you time. Another 10 years of this, and you'll be able to communicate well. Now, to us, it's just that's what it takes. But to the little kid, they're like, this is never going to end. And that's how we all feel with the Lord's process. But it will be in the twinkling of an eye, and we'll look back, and we'll say, yeah, that was worth it. It didn't take nearly as long as, I, as it could have. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So whenever we start complaining about how long it's taking, remember that the Lord is being patient, not willing that any should perish. And if even we get to the point that, hey, we're ready for the Lord to come, we think we've kind of got this somewhat figured out, he says, well, the harvest hasn't been brought in. Like Paul says, he'd rather depart and be with Christ. But for his brethren's sake, he remains, for, for, to, for the joy of the church to help grow their faith. So once we kind of get things together in our lives a little bit, well, it's time to go get others. Time for evangelism. It's time to spread this truth and let your light shine. And don't hide it under a bushel. So that's how you get out of this complaining spirit, is you go take what you have and you go use it. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? You know it's all going to come to end. You know every deed is going to be judged. We know that. So then how ought we to obey? Like, if you knew the Lord was coming in the next 10 minutes, how would you behave yourself? You'd be really good, wouldn't you? 
Well, what about in an hour? What about in a day? What about a month, a year, 10 years, 20 years? Why does it matter how long it takes? It's the same result in the end. And since you don't know when it is, you got to always be ready. And But we'll quickly realize that we can't be always ready. And we fall short of that. And so we have to pray for the faith and the power to overcome and to not fall asleep in the garden and not become lax because it's, it's just more than we can do of ourselves. Looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. The new heavens and the new earth are within, first and foremost, where we want to have these things come to pass now. Because that is the light that shines to the world, is that they see that we're a people that fear God and want to keep his commands and don't indulge in the carnal pleasure of this life because we know what's going to come. This is Matthew 24, starting in verse 36 down to 51. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Then two men will be in the field, one will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and the other left. Watch, therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known the hour the thief would come, would he have watched and not allowed? He would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his, whom his master made ruler over his household to give them food in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing. Assuredly, I say to you that he will make him ruler over all his goods. But if that evil servant says in his heart, my master delay is delaying his coming, and begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunkards, the master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him in an hour that he is not aware of and will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So that's Christ's warning to us is be ready in season and out of season, ready at all times. But because he tells us this, we're not going to do it at first and we're going to be caught off guard and not ready and, be embarrassed and ashamed about that. And it's going to give us great zeal to get up and with more passion than before, press on to be ready. Zephaniah 3, 6 to 8. This is our last set of verses for tonight. I have cut off nations. Their fortresses are devastated. I have made their streets desolate with none passing by. Their cities are destroyed. There is no one. No inhabitant. I said, surely you will fear me. You will receive instruction so that her dwelling would not be cut off. Despite everything for which I punished her, but they rose early and corrupted all their deeds. Therefore, wait for me, says the Lord, until the day I rise up for plunder. My determination is to gather the nations to my assembly of kingdoms, to pour on them my indignation, all my fierce anger. All the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. So what's he saying here? He's saying, I'm going to destroy these nations and these things within you. So have fear of me. Desire that. Want it to happen and wait for me to do it. And he will. And as then he, as he cleanses what's within us, then we'll look to the outward world, having fear on the Lord, and wait for the same thing to happen outwardly. For him to do it to everyone, because everyone's going to have the fierce anger of his wrath poured on them, just as it's poured on the elect first. So don't think we get to skip all these steps. We go through all the terrible things it says before we get to receive the good ones. So that's why 
we're suffering and it's painful and it's taking so long and he's just getting us ready. And then as we grow and mature, we just become more and more patient to patiently endure like Christ did with all those around him. Because at first we suffer for evil and then we suffer for righteousness. But you're still suffering either way. It's just a matter of why are you suffering. And it's much more glorious to be suffering for persecution and doing the right thing than it is to be suffering for just being foolish and lacking self-control and all of those things. So that is the end of those who wait for the Lord will not be ashamed.